out a couple of passages of scripture for me to read today. And so I will do that. And the first of which is going to be very familiar to all. Okay. We're going to read 1 Corinthians chapter 13, which is called the love chapter, to remind us of what love truly is. If I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels, but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy, and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains, but I didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable and it keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up. It never loses faith. Love is always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. Prophecy and speaking in unknown languages and special knowledge will all become useless, but love will last forever. Now our knowledge is partial and incomplete, and even the gift of prophecy reveals only part of the whole picture. But when the time of perfection comes, these partial things will become useless. When I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. Now we see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror. But then we will see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial and incomplete. But then I will know everything completely, just as God knows me completely. Three things will last forever. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. That's the first, first thing that I think I learned out of the Bible was the love chapter when I was little. My mother was trying to teach me how to be patient and kind and not proud and not boastful. So she said, well, let's, let's the word of God teach you. You'll believe the Bible. <laughs> so that was my, my first indication that God wants us to love and be kind. And then Phyllis also asked me to read from the book of John, Gospel of John, in the first chapter, and what are the verses? Nine through 13. Nine through 13, okay. So I'll read from there. This is talking about Jesus. The one who is the true light, who gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He came into the very world he created, but the world didn't recognize him. He came to his own people, and even they rejected him. But to all who believed and accepted him, he gave the right to become the children of God. They are reborn, not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. Isn't that wonderful? I think that's the only way we can actually do what I read before love and be patient and gentle is when we accept that new nature from God. And that's all I have to read today. I think it's Tom's turn. If you'd like to come up, Tom. You want to put the yep. on it? Do you want to sit or do you want to stand? Hey, Clark. Do you want to sit or do you want to stand? I'll stand. Okay. Mm 
If I could each speak all the languages of earth and of angels, but did not love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Mm -hmm. If I had the gift of prophecy, and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains, but did not love others, I would be nothing. Mm -hmm. If I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable and it keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith. It's always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. Prophecy in speaking in unknown languages and special knowledge will become useless, but love will last forever. Now our knowledge is partial and incomplete, but even the gift of prophecy reveals only part of the whole picture. But when full understanding comes, these, these particular things will become useless. When I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. Now we see things imperfectly, as in a cloudy mirror. But when we will see everything, but then we will see everything with perfect clarity. Mm -hmm. And that I know now is partial and incomplete. But then I will know everything completely, just as God knows me completely. Mm -hmm. Three things will last forever. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. Yeah. <coughs> Brad, thank you very much for reading that. And um, it reminds me of, of um, <coughs> how I can accept what God has for me, no matter where I am, uh, no matter who I'm with, and uh, I can trust him. And I hope that each one of you can learn to love and trust one another as we live together in this home. And uh, we have so much to be thankful for. And I'm thankful for everybody who was able to come today Thankful for uh, family members, uh, for Brad, and uh, anyway, <laughs> every everyone. Mm -hmm. So, what's the best plan for you and I as we continue this day? Three things will last forever. And the greatest of these is love. So let's challenge each other to be loving and kind and uh, to get that joy in this place every day. Amen to them. Amen. Thank you, Tom.
Thank you, Brad. And thank you, my big brother. My big little brother, as I call him. <clears throat> He's got 18 years on me. So by the time I was born, he was pretty much gone. My sister, uh, our other brother, he was still at home for a short time. And I remember <clears throat> sharing a uh, uh, sharing a bedroom with him for one summer. <clears throat> and then he was gone. So it was pretty much me growing up by myself. Kind of a, a lonely existence. And I still so I'm, uh, we were all living out here in Colorado at that time, and then the folks and I moved back to Illinois. And I think, uh, I think I was somewhere between 11, 12, 13 years old, and we stayed in Illinois. We would come back to Colorado and visit, once, twice a year, but the years went on and I grew up and Tom had family and uh, we were separated by a thousand miles. And I didn't really feel like I knew my brothers and my sister. I mean, they were like a little brother, I would always look up to them, but the, the attachment, I, I missed that. But it, and I've spoken about this before, how this man loved me unconditionally. Now I want you to remember that, loved me unconditionally. Now the passages that were read this morning, 1 Corinthians 13 and John chapter 1, spoke to specific things regarding love. And love is the most used and misused of all the words in the English language. I was, uh, as I was studying about this, there are dimensions of love. I didn't know this. Passion, intimacy, and commitment. It's a triangular theory that love can be understood in three components. How ridiculous a statement is that? How do you compartmentalize love? Or even how can you put it into a triangular theory and say it consists of nothing more than passion, intimacy, and commitment. It's too big to be compartmentalized. The definition that is given for love, an intense, deep affection for another person. What? That's it? That's, that's the best that, that Webster could come up with? So I started pondering this whole thing. I know what love is to me. But as I started to think about it in a greater capacity, and this is going back to liking versus loving. You all remember Gomer Pyle? I love watching him. Golly! 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 <laughs> this was a situation of liking versus loving with Gomer. I like you, but I don't love you. Yeah. I just thought that was so cool. I like you, but I don't love you. Yeah. Love is the greatest of all human qualities 
It is an attribute of God himself. So, how do you squeeze it down into something that is understandable and comfortable for all of us? And I think as we've gotten older, love takes on a whole different dimension. And I came to a realization and thank you, God, for my wife that kept me on track with this realization. God, the creator, we are his children. He created us. Now, if you go back in history, one little component that kind of sticks out has to do with human genetics. We're all related. We're all related. Think about it. We're all of the same genetic pool. From a human standpoint, brothers and sisters and brothers and sisters and brothers and sisters and on and on and on and on. But going all the way back, we're connected. We're related human genetics. We're all children of God. But my wife pointed out, and I'm so glad she did, I need to listen to her more. There's a distinction. I didn't think about this. I was so excited about this other thing that we're all related. But, and here's the big, big distinction. We're not family. Unless we're bound by our love and our belief in Jesus Christ. He's the deciding factor in all of this. Without him, yeah, we're all related. But there has to be that distinction. God declared it and God demanded it. Children of God, yes. But wandering children. How many of them are wandering the wrong direction. So far off base. And unfortunately, in this world today, they're wandering farther and farther and farther away. To a point where God and Jesus and love are the last thing they want to talk about. Kate and I were talking about it coming down the canyon this morning. Mm -hmm. We're being persecuted right here in America. We're being persecuted by people, and this is the part that hurts, by friends and even by family <coughs> because we decided to take a stand for Jesus Christ. And the very thing that binds us to him is love. And what Jesus did for you and I was the greatest, greatest show of love throughout history. He took your sins and mine to the cross. You know the story, you've heard it. But he did that out of love. Love, the greatest of all human qualities. Now my wife, and I found this in my, uh, my reading, 
And I just, I love this line. I want my love for you to be the loudest thing about me. I want my love for her to be the loudest thing about me. Phil, shut up, you're too loud. I'm sorry, I love her. And you know what? It's not enough as somebody that has been saved by the grace and blood of my Lord and Savior for me to look out at you and say, well, I like you, but I don't love you. How, how shallow that makes me. If I'm going to live this life and live it accordingly and live it courageously, then I have to look in every one of your eyes and say, I love you. Mm. And I do. It's not just a commandment, it's a compulsion. Because if you've got the love of Jesus in your heart, you can't contain it. It's got to come out. It's got to be shared. Because we're not family unless we're bound by our love for him. And we love him because of what he did for us. So like my brother said, take this love and share it. You have a wonderful, wonderful community here. Wonderful people. That's why we keep coming back. You're not going to get rid of us. We're going to keep showing up. It may not be every Sunday, but we're going to show up. We'll be here. Because we have to demonstrate this greatest of all human qualities. We have to take it to the next level. This world is so rapidly being consumed by hate. And that is such an evil word. But love, love is like this great warrior that comes and chops hate right in half. Hate cannot fight love. Love is too powerful. It always has been, and it always will be. Mm. You have people that you love. Make your love for them be the loudest thing about you. Amen? Mm -hmm. Amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for what you did on the cross. Thank you for the life that you live, the lessons that you taught, the examples that you made. Most of all, most of all, thank you for the love that you have shown us. We're all broken. Some of us more broke than others. We're all sinners. But because of the free gift of salvation, all we have to do is open up our minds and our hearts and our souls to receive you. To receive you into our lives. And make us and build us and disciple us into the people that you want us to be. And I know the first and foremost thing you want us to do is to love one another as you have loved us. May that be our, our daily goal 
from here on in. I thank you for these people. Gracious Lord, I thank you for this place that they share. I ask for your love and for your protection over each and every one of them. And to show them, Lord, each day, in just those little things, how much you love them. In your name I pray. Thank you, Phil. It's just like the, the word from the book of John that I read. To them that believe on his name, he gave the power to become the sons of God. We are adopted when we believe into the family of God. Isn't that wonderful to know that we are family, true family, adopted into the family of God, sons and daughters of the king. And we can treat each other <coughs> as though we really are sons and daughters of the king with our love. Jesus even said that. He said, they'll know that you're my disciples by your love for one another. So when we show love, that's a witness to other people that we belong to Christ. Mm -hmm. Are you ready, Phil? I think so. <laughs> well, now that I'm standing, I'm just going to keep standing. I have one other thing I want to share with you real quick. And it's about this song that we're going to sing right now. We haven't done this before, but I've sung it probably two or three hundred times in my lifetime. It's a genuine product of the Midwest United States. Mm -hmm. It jumped into life, this song did, as the result of an impromptu conversation between Samuel Fillmore Bennett who lived from 1836 to 1898, and his musician friend, Joseph P. Webster, who lived from 1819 to 1875, in Elkhorn, Wisconsin. She's from Wisconsin. In the years of the gospel song makers in the mid 19th century. Now Webster, came into Bennett's office one day looking very depressed. Bennett asked him, what's the matter? What's going on? He replies, ah, don't worry about it. I'll be all right by and by. That phrase leaped into life for Bennett, the sweet by and by. He thought, he says, that would make a great hymn. Then and there, he started to write the verse, there's a land that is fairer than day, and by faith we can see it afar. For the Father waits over the way to prepare us a dwelling place there. Webster's friend, he caught his enthusiasm. He hummed out a melody, and bringing in a friend with a violin, the three of them sat down and wrote this song. In the 